Chapter 71 If you are really determined to undertake this expedition, I shall send Fa Zheng with you, said Zhu Jiang to the veteran leader. You will have to discuss everything with him. I shall also dispatch supports and reinforcements. Huang Zhang agreed and the expedition set out. Then Zhu Jiang explained to Liu Bei, I purposely tried to spur on the old general that he will really exert himself, else he fears he will not do much, but he will need reinforcement. After this, Yu Jiang ordered Zhao Zilong to march after the first army and help if help was needed, so long as the old man was victorious. Zhao Zilong was to do nothing. If he was in difficulties, then Zhao Zilong was to rescue. Three thousand troops under Lu Feng and Meng Dao were sent out among the hills to take position at strategic points and set up many banners and make a brave show in order to spread the impression of huge forces and so frighten and perplex the enemy. In addition, Zhu Jiang sent to Zibian Pass to tell Marqueo what part to play in the campaign. Yan was to hold Langzhong and Baxi in place of Zhang Fei, and Wai Yan who also went in expedition in Hanzhong. The refugees, Zhang He and Zai Shang reached Zai Yun's camp and told their doleful tale Tending Mountain has been captured, and Zai Hudu and Han Hao have died with the loss. Liu Bei is about to invade Hanzhong. Send a swift messenger to inform the Prince of Wai and ask for help. The news was sent to Cao Hong, who bore it quickly to capital Suching. Cao lost no time in calling a council. Then High Minister Liu Yi said the loss of Hanzhen would shake the whole middle land. You, O oh Prince, must not shrink from toil and hardship, but must yourself go to lead the army. This state of things comes of my not heeding your words before, gentle sir, said Cao Cao, then repentant. However, Cao Cao hastily prepared and issued an edict to raise an army of 400,000 troops, which he would lead. The army was ready in the seventh month, the early autumn, in the 23rd year D.E. 218, and marched in three divisions. The leading division was under Zhao Dun. Cao Cao commanded the center, and Cao Zhu was the rear guard. Cao Cao rode a white horse beautifully caparisoned. His guards were clad in embroidered silk. They carried the huge red parasol woven of silk and gold threads. Beside him in two lines were the symbols of kingly dignity, the golden melons, silver axes, stirrups, clubs, spears, and lances. Banderoles embroidered with the sun and moon, dragon and phoenix, all were borne aloft. His imperial escort of twenty-five thousand stout warriors led by bold officers marched in five columns of five thousand each under banners of the five colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black. The five companies made a brave show as they marched, each column under its own flag, with soldiers in armors and horses in caparisons, all of one color, and all glittering in the sun. As they debouched through Tong Pass, Cao Cao noticed in the distance a thick wood very luxuriant, and asked those near him what it was called. This place is the indigo field, they replied, and in that wood is the estate of the late minister Kai Yong. His daughter Kai Yang and her present husband Don Si live there. Now Cao Cao and Kai Yang had been excellent friends at one time. Kai Yang's daughter had been first married to Wai Zhang Da. Then she was abducted by the frontier tribes and taken away to the north, where she had borne two sons. She had composed a ballad called Eighteen Stanzas for the Mongol flagellate, which was widespread to the empire. Cao Cao had been moved by pity for her sorrows and sent a messenger with a thousand ounces of gold to ransom her. The prince of the frontier Chinyu state, Cizai and the Khan, overawed by Cao Cao's strength, had restored her to Kai Yang. Then Cao Cao gave her in marriage to Dong Si. Ordering his escort to march on Cao Cao went up to the gate with only a few attendants, dismounted, and inquired after the lady of the house. At this time Dong Si was absent at his post, and the lady was alone. As soon as she heard who her visitor was, she hastened to welcome him and led him into the reception room. When Cao Cao was seated, and she had performed the proper salutations, she stood respectfully at his side. Glancing round the room, Cao Cao saw a rubbing of a tablet hanging on the wall. So he got up to read it and asked his hostess about it. It is a tablet of Cao Yi, or the fair lady Cao. In the time of the emperor he AD 100, in the Chinyu state there was a certain magician named Cao Zhu who could dance and sing like the very spirit of music. On the fifth of the fifth month, 
He was out in a boat and being intoxicated, fell overboard, and was drowned. He had a daughter, Kaui, then fourteen years of age. She was greatly distressed and sought the body of her father for seven days and nights, weeping all the while. Then she threw herself into the waves and five days later she floated to the surface with her father's body in her arms. The villagers buried them on the bank, and the magistrate reported the occurrence to the emperor as a worthy instance of daughterly affection and remarkable piety. A later magistrate had the story inscribed by Handan Chun in memory of the event. At that time Handan Chun was only thirteen, but the composition of the inscription was so perfect that neither jot nor tittle could be added, and yet he had written it impromptu without revision. The stone was set up beside the grave, and both inscription and story were the admiration of all the people of that day. My father went to see it. It was evening, but in the obscurity he felt out the inscription with his fingers. He got hold of a pencil and wrote eight large characters on the reverse of the stone, and later some person recutting the stone engraved these eight words as well. A cow then read the eight words. They formed an enigma. Literally they read yellow silk, young wife, a daughter's child, pestle, and mortar. Can you explain? asked Cow Cow of his hostess. No. Although it is a writing of my father's, thy handmaid cannot interpret it, she replied. Turning to the strategist of his staff, Cow Cow said, Can any one of you explain it? But no one made any reply. Suddenly, they heard one voice, I have grasped the meaning of it. The man, who said he had fathomed the meaning, was first secretary Yang Zhu. Do not tell me yet. Let me think it out, said Cow Cow. Soon after they took leave of the lady, went out of the farm, and rode on. About one mile from the farm, the meaning suddenly dawned upon Cow Cow. He laughingly turned to Yang Zhu, saying, Now, you may try. This is the solution of the enigma, said Yang Zhu. Yellow silk is silk threads of natural color, and the character for silk placed beside the for color forms a word meaning finally, decidedly. The young wife is a little female, and the character for female with little, or few, placed beside it forms a word meaning admirable fine. The daughter's child is daughter and child, which side by side make the word good. And a pestle and mortar suggest pounding together the five bitter herbs in a receptacle, the character for receptacle, and bitter form a word meaning to tell. So the four words are decidedly fine and well told. Cow Cow was astonished at Yong Zhu's cleverness, and said just what I made it. Those around greatly wondered at Yang Zhu's ingenuity and knowledge. In less than a day they reached Nanjing where Cao Hong welcomed them. He told the tale of Zhang Yi's misfortunes. To suffer defeat is no crime, said Cao Cao. That and victory are things that happen constantly in war. Liu Bei has sent Hong Zhang to take Dington Mountain, said Cao Hong. Zaya Hong Yu and hearing you were coming, O oh, Prince, has been defending the position, and not going out to give battle, but standing always on the defensive, showing weakness, said Cao Cao. Thereupon he bade a man carry an authority and sign to the mountain commander and so order him to attack the enemy. Zaya Hu Yun is very stern and inflexible, and he may be carried too far and fall victim to some vile ruse, said Liu Yi. Wherefore the prince wrote a letter to him to accompany the authority and sign. And when the messenger arrived and the letter was opened, it read, Every leader must exercise a combination of inflexibility and yielding. Boldness is not the only thing that counts. If he makes it so, then is he a mere creature to fight. Now I am camped at Nanjing ready to watch the deeds of your admirable prowess and capacity, and all I have to say is, do not disgrace your previous reputation. The letter pleased the commander mightily. Having sent away the bearer, Zio Yun called in Zhang Yi to consult. The prince has a great army at Nanjing ready to destroy Liu Bei. We have been on the defense here long enough, and it is time we rendered some solid service. Tomorrow I am going out to battle, and hope to capture Huang Zhang. Your opponent combines ready resource with boldness and provision, said Zhang He. Beside, he has Fa Zheng to aid him, and you must be cautious, for the country is very difficult and dangerous. You had better keep on the defensive. How shall we be able to look our prince in the face when other leaders render good services? However, you just keep the hill, 
and I would go out to battle. Then an order was issued asking who would go out to reconnoiter and provoke a battle. Xiao Sheng volunteered. Xiao Yun said to him, You are not to make a real stand, but merely to begin the fight. You are to lose, and not win, for a grand ruse is ready for the enemy. He explained his plans, and Xiao Sheng went away with a small column. Now Huang Zhang and his helper Fa Zheng were camped quite close to the Dingjun Mountain. They had endeavored to entice Xiao Yun out into the field to fight, but failed to attack him as he stood in the difficult, mountainous country. So thus far no advance had been made. But as soon as Xiao Shang's troops appeared and seemed to offer battle, Huang Zhang was ready to march out to meet them at once. But General Chen Shi offered his services. Do not trouble yourself to move, O oh General, said Chen Shi, for I will go out to fight them. Huang Zhang consented and placed three thousand troops under Chen Shi, who went out of the valley and set his army in array. And when Xiao Shang came up, and as arranged, merely fought a few bouts and ran away. Chen Shi followed to take advantage of his success, but he was soon brought to a standstill by the rolling of logs and hurling of stones on the part of his opponents. As he turned to retire, Xia Hu Yun brought out his troops and attacked. Chen Shi had no chance against them and was quickly made prisoner. Many of his soldiers joined the enemy, but a few escaped to their own side and told Wang Zhang of the misfortune. Wang Zhang at once asked advice from Fa Sheng, who said this Xiao Hu Yun is easily provoked to anger, and being angry he is bold without discretion. Your way now is to work up the enthusiasm of your soldiers, then break camp and advance. Do this in a series of marches, and you will excite him up to the point of giving battle, when you can capture him. They call this the ruse of the interchange of host and guest. So Wang Zhang collected all the things his soldiers liked, and made them presents till the sound of rejoicing filled the whole valley and the men were hot to fight. Then camp was broken, and the army marched forward a certain distance. Then they encamped. After some days' rest the march was repeated, and then again. When tidings of the advance reached Xiao Yu and he proposed to go out and fight, No, no, said the prudent Zhang He, this is a well-known ruse, and you should remain on the defensive. You will lose if you fight. Xiao Yuan was not the man to stomach this moderate advice, so he sent out Xiao Shang to give battle. As soon as this force reached the camp of Hong Zhang, the veteran general mounted and rode out to fight. In the very first bout he captured Xiao Shang. Those who escaped told how their leader had been captured, and Xiao Yuan at once sent to offer an exchange of prisoners. This was agreed to to be effected the following day in front of both armies. So next day both sides were arrayed in a spot where the valley widened, the two leaders on horseback beneath their respective standards. Beside each stood his prisoner. Neither was encumbered with robe or helmet, but each wore thin, simple dress. At the first beat of the drum each started to race over to his own side. Just as Xiao Shang reached the ranks of his own side, Wang Zhang shot an arrow and wounded him in the back. The wounded man did not fall, but went on. But Xia Hu Yuan, mad with rage, could contain himself no longer. He galloped straight at Huang Zhang, which was exactly what the latter wanted to irritate him into doing. The fight that then ensued went on for twenty bouts, when suddenly the gongs clanged out from Xia Hu Yuan's side, and he drew off. Huang Zhang pressed on and shattered the army of Wai. When Xia Hu Yuan reached his own side, he asked why the gong had sounded because we saw the banners of Shu through openings in the mountains in several places, and we feared an ambush, said Zhang He. Xia Hu Yun believed him, and did not return to the battlefield. He simply remained defensive. Before long, Huang Zhang had got quite near to Xia Hu Yun's camp, and then he asked further advice from his colleague. Fa Zheng pointed over to the hills and said there rises a steep hill on the west of Dingjun Mountain, difficult of access, but from its summit one as a complete view of the defences of the enemy. If you can take this hill, the mountain lies in the hollow of your hand. Wang Zhang looked up and saw the top of the hill was a small tableland, and there were very few defenders there. So that evening he left his camp, dashed up the hill, drove out the small host of one hundred under Xiao Yun's general Du Zai, and took it. It was just opposite to Dingjun Mountain. Then said Fa Zheng, now take up position halfway up the hill. 
while I go to the top. When the enemy appears, I will show a white flag. But you will remain quiet till the enemy become tired and remiss when I will hoist a red flag. That will be the signal for attack. Huang Zhang cheerfully prepared to act on this plan. In the meantime, Gu Zai, who had been driven from the hilltop, had run back and reported the loss of the hill to Zai Huyun. With Huang Zhang in occupation of that hill, I simply must give battle, said Zai Huyun. Zhang, he strongly dissuaded him, saying, The whole thing is but a ruse of Fa Zheng. General, you had better defend our position. But Zai Huyun was obstinate. From the top of the hill the whole of our position is visible, our strength and our weakness. I must fight. In vain were the remonstrances repeated. Zaya Yun set out his troops to surround the opposite hill, then began to vent his rage at his enemy so as to incite Wang Zhang to give battle. Then the white flag was hoisted. However, Zaya Yun was allowed to fume and rage in vain. He tried every form of insult, but no one appeared. In the afternoon the soldiers became weary and dispirited. Plainly their eagerness had gone, and Fa Zheng unfurled the red flag. Then the drums rolled out, and the men of Shu shouted till the earth seemed to shake, as the hoary old leader rode out and led his force down the slope with a roar as of an earthquake. Zai Yuan was too surprised to defend himself. His chief enemy rushed straight to his standard. With a thundering shout, Wang Zhang raised his sword and cleft Zai Yun through between the head and shoulder so that he fell in two pieces. Hoary headed is he, but he goes up to battle. Ray head, yet recklessly mighty. With his strong arms he bends the bow. The arrows fly. With the swiftness of the wind he rides. The white sword gleams. The sound of his voice is as the roar of a tiger. His steed is fleet as a dragon in flight. Victory is his and its rich rewards, for he extends the domain of his lord. At the death of their general, the soldiers of Wai fled for their lives, and Huang Zhang attacked Lingzhen Mountain. Zhang he came out to oppose the army of Shu, but attacked at two points by Huang Zhang and Chen Shi he could not stand. He lost the day and fled. However, before he had gone far, another cohort flashed out from the hills and barred his way. And the leader cried out, Zhao Zilong of Changshan is here. Confused and uncertain what to do, Zhang he led his troops toward Dington Mountain. But a body of soldiers came out to stop him. The leader was Du Zai, who said the mountain is in the hands of Liu Feng and Meng Da. So Zhang he and Du Zai joined their forces and went to River Han, where they camped. Thence they sent to tell Cao Cao of their defeat. At the news of the death of Zai Yu and Cao Cao uttered a great cry, and then he understood the prediction of the soothsayer, Wan Lu, that the caste showed opposition. It was the twenty-fourth year of rebuilt tranquility three and eight cross, the yellow bore the month Zai who you and died had met the tiger. The expedition had suffered a loss indeed by the death of a general, and the death had taken place at the mount known as Army Hortingen. The affection between Cao Cao and his general had been very close, for he considered Zai who you and as his limb. Cao Cao sent to inquire the whereabouts of Guan Lu, but no one knew. A cow nourished feelings of resentment against the slayer of his friend, and he led his army out against Lingjun Mountain to avenge Zai Yun's death. Zhu Huang led the van. When the army reached River Han, Zhang He and Du Zai joined them. They said to Cao Cao, Dingjun Mountain is lost. Before marching farther, the stores in Miking Mountain should be moved to the northern mountain. And Cao Cao agreed. Hong Zhang cut off the head of Zai Yun and took it to Liu Bei when he reported his victory. For these services, Liu Bei conferred upon him the title general who conquers the West and great banquets were given in his honor. While these were going on, General Zhang Zhu brought the news Cao Cao's army of 200,000 troops is on the way to avenge Zai Yun's loss, and the supplies on Miking Mountain are being moved to the Northern Mountain. Then, said Zhu Jiang, Cao Cao is certainly short of supplies. If we can burn what he has, and destroy his baggage train, he will have but little spirit left to fight. I am willing to undertake the task, said Huang Zhao. Remember Cao Cao is a different sort of man from Zai Hu Yun. Liu Bei said, Zhang He is the escort leader of the train. Though Zai Hu Yun was the mountain commander, after all he was but a bold warrior. It would have been ten times better to have killed Zhang He. I will go and kill him, said the aged general firing up. Then go with Zhao Zilong, 
said Zhu Zhang, act in concert and see who can do best. Wang Zhang agreed to this condition, and Zhang Zhu was sent with him as marching general. Soon after the army had marched out, Zhao Zilong asked of his colleague, what plan have you prepared against Cao Cao's army of 200,000 in their ten camps, and how are the stores of grain and forage to be destroyed? I am going to lead, said Huang Zhang. No, wait. I am going first, said Zhao Zilong. But I am the senior leader. You are only my second, said Huang Zhang. No, you and I are equal in responsibility and both anxious to render good service. We are no rivals. Let us cast lots for who is to lead the way. They did so, and the veteran general gained precedence. Since you have won the right to make the first attempt, you must let me help you, said Zhao Zilong. Now let us decide upon a fixed time, and if you have returned by that time, I shall not need to stir. But if at that time you have not come back, then I shall come to reinforce you. That suits me admirably, said Huang Zhang. So they decided upon noon as the time. Zhao Zilong went back to his own camp, where he called in his deputy general Chan Yi, and said my friend Huang Zhang is going to try to burn the stores tomorrow. If he has not returned at noon, I am to go to aid him. You are to guard our camp, which is in a dangerous place by the river, but you are not to move out unless compelled. Huang Zhang went back to his camp, and said to his general, Zhang Zhu, I have slain Zai Yuan and Kao Zhang Yi. I am going to destroy the enemy's store of grain tomorrow, taking with me most of the troops. You are to come and assist me. A meal for the men is to be ready about midnight tonight, and we shall move at the fourth watch. We shall march to the foot of their hill, capture Zhang He, and then start the fire. All being ready, they set out Wang Zhang leading and stole across River Han to the foot of the hills. As the sun got up out of the east, they saw before the mountains of grain, and only a few guards on watch. These fled at first sight of the army of Shu. The horsemen dismounted, and began to collect brushwood, and pile it round the grain heaps. Just as they were starting the fire, there appeared a cohort led by Zhang He, who at once began a fight with Huang Zhao. Then Cao Cao heard of the fight, and sent Zhu Huang to help. Zhu Huang came up in the rear, and Huang Zhao was surrounded. Zhang Zhu with three thousand troops tried to get away to their camp, but they were intercepted by Wen Ping, and more troops of Wai coming up by the rear, Zhang Zhu also was surrounded. Both were in difficulties. Meanwhile time passed, and noon came with no news of Huang Zhang. Wherefore Zhao Zilong girded on his armor, took three thousand troops with him, and went to his aid. Just as he was leaving, he again warned Zhang Yi to keep good watch. Guard the camp most carefully. See that you have archers and crossbowmen on both sides. Yes, yes, said Zhang Yi. Zhao Zilong rode off spear in hand, and went out to give battle where he could find the enemy. Soon he fell in with one of Wen Ping's companies led by General Murong Lai. Zhao Zilong plunged in, cut Murong Lai down, and disposed of the troops of Wai. Then he came to the real press. A cohort barred his way, led by General Jiao Bing. Where are the soldiers of Shu? cried Zhao Zilong. All killed, cried Jiao Bing. Zhao Zilong angrily dashed forward, and thrust Jiao Bing through so that he died. The cohort scattered, and Zhao Zilong went on to the foot of Northern Mountain, where he found Huang Zhang surrounded. With a yell Zhao Zilong dashed the encircling ring, thrusting this way and shabbing, that so that everyone shrank and recoiled before him. The mighty spear laid low his opponents like the whirlwind scatters the petals of the wild pear tree till they lie on the bosom of the earth like snowflakes. Panic seized Zhang He and Zhu Huang so that they dared not stand in his way, and thus Zhao Zilong fought his way through and rescued his fellow warrior. Then they fought their way out and none could withstand them. Okawa had been watching the course of the fighting from a high place, and when he saw a doughty warrior forcing his way into the press, and all going down before him, he asked of his officers if they knew who the leader was. That is Zhao Zilong of Changshan, replied one who knew. So the hero of Deng Yang is still alive, said Cao Cao marveled. Then Cao Cao gave general orders to his soldiers not to attack Zhao Zilong without being sure of success, no matter where they met him. Having rescued his colleague and got clear of the battle, Zhao Zilong was told Zhang Zhu hemmed in on a hill not far off. Wherefore Zhao Zilong went to his relief before going back to his own camp. He had little need to fight, 
for Cao Cao's soldiers no sooner saw the name emblazoned on the banners than they fled without more ado. But it filled Cao Cao with rage to see his troops falling away before Zhao Zilong, who marched on as though no one would think of standing in his way. And Cao Cao went in pursuit himself with his officers. Zhao Zilong reached his own camp, where he was welcomed by Zhang Yi. But a cloud of dust was seen in the distance, and they knew Cao Cao was in that cloud, and coming upon them. Let us bar the gates, while we make preparation, said Zhang Yi. Do not bar the gates, said Zhao Zilong. Have you never heard of my exploit at Danyong, when I laughed at Cao Cao's many legions? Now that I have an army at my back and generals to help, what is there to fear? Then Zhao Zilong placed the archers and the bowmen in a covered position outside, while he threw down all the weapons and flags within, and no drums beat. But he himself, alone, stood outside the gate of the camp. It was dusk when Zhang He and Zhu Hong neared the camp of the army of Shu. They saw that the ensigns and weapons had been overthrown, and no drums beat at their approach. They also saw the one figure of the doughty warrior at the gate, and then they halted and dared advance no farther. While they hesitated, Cao Cao arrived and urged his army to march quicker. They answered with a shout and made a dash forward, but they saw the one figure at the gate, and every man halted. And before long, one by one, they turned about and went away. Then Zhao Zilong gave a signal to his troops to come out of the moat, and the archers and bowmen began to shoot. The soldiers of Cao Cao knew not in the dusk how many their enemies were, but terror seized upon them, and they ran, each trying to be first. And as they ran, the drums rolled, and the soldiers of Shu shouted and pursued, till the fight became a perfect rout, and a confused mass of troops reached the banks of River Han. The press continuing, many soldiers of Cao Cao were forced into the river and were drowned. Zhao Zilong Hongzhong and Zhang Zhu followed close on the heels of the routed army. While Cao Cao was making off with all speed, two other generals of Shu Liu Feng and Meng Da came from Miking Mountain and set fire to all the army stores of food and forage in Northern Mountain. Then Cao Cao abandoned the stores in Northern Mountain and set out hastily for Nanjing. Zhang He and Zhu Huan could make no stand, and they also abandoned their camps, which Xiao Zilong at once occupied. Beside the stores of food, the victors collected countless weapons along the banks of the river. They sent news of the victory to Liu Bei, who came with huge land to the scene of the victory, and there they heard the full story of Zhao Zilong's prowess. Liu Bei was very glad, and when he had seen the steepness and difficulties of the surrounding hills, he understood the fine deeds of valor that had been done. Turning to Zhu Jian, Liu Bei said, Truly the man is brave all through. Behold Zhao Zilong of Changshan, whose whole body is valor. Formerly he fought at Danyong, and his courage today is no less. He rushes into the array to manifest heroism. Surrounded by his enemies, he is dauntless and daring. Devils howl and spirits cry. The sky is afraid and earth trembles. Such is Zhao Zilong the brave, whose whole body is valor. For his services Liu Bei gave Zhao Zilong the title of general who possesses tiger prowess. And the soldiers of his army were rewarded, and there was banqueting to a late hour. Soon it was reported Cao Cao was coming again down through the Xi Valley to try to capture River Han. But Liu Bei laughed, saying, He will not succeed, for I think that we shall gain command of the river. Then Liu Bei led his army west of the river to oppose Cao Cao. When Cao Cao drew near, he sent out Zhu Hong to lead the van and open the battle. A general named Wang Ping said, I know the country well, and I wish to help General Zhu Huang to destroy the army of Shu. Wang Ping was sent as second in command. A cow camped on the north of Dingjun Mountain, and his advanced guard marched away making for River Han. And when they reached the bank, Zhu Huang gave orders to cross to the other side. To cross the river is well, said Wang Ping, but what if you have to retreat? Of old, when Han Xin made his array with the river in his rear, he said that out of the place of death one could return to life. You are mistaken now. The cases are not the same, for then Han Xin knew his opponents were unskillful. Have you reckoned upon the skill of our opponents, Zhao Zilong and Huang Zhang? You may need the footmen to hold the enemy while I destroy them with the horsemen, said Zhu Huang. Then bridges were built and the army crossed. A man of Wai wildly quoted Han Xin. 
A minister of Shu would be another Zhang Liang, who won the victory will next be revealed.